COVID-19 has changed the way we work. Restrictions have forced people to operate from home instead of the office. But millions are also now quitting their jobs in what's dubbed the Great Resignation. So, will 2022 be a turning point for labor relations? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. For two years now, because of the pandemic, many of us have had to change the way we work. Working from home is becoming the norm as people avoid crowded transport systems and offices. Even some journalists producing this program are operating remotely. And with the Omicron variant spreading fast, more governments are encouraging so-called hybrid work. For example, France has told people to work from home at least three days a week if they can. It's a further challenge to work-life balance. Surveys found people are working up to three hours more a day than before the pandemic. In some cities, companies have decided to rent less office space or redesign them to allow more social distancing between employees. Many commercial offices want to shrink the footprint they have, uh, at least as, terms, as far as workspace goes, expand the open space, the amenity space in the offices so there's more room for, a, for flow, so people aren't on top of each other. While some can work from home, people in the healthcare and hospitality industries don't have that option. As lockdowns forced shops and restaurants to close, employees went for months without pay. Other essential workers, including couriers and warehouse staff or e for e-commerce giants such as Amazon, often worked without sick pay or medical insurance. The pandemic has led to what some have dubbed the Great Resignation. Millions of employees unhappy with their jobs quit to pursue roles with better work-life balance. In the U.S., a record 4.4 million people resigned in September. And a survey of 6,000 British workers found a quarter of them want to change employers within three to six months. Job vacancies are at record highs in many industrialized nations, with companies struggling to hire and retain staff. All right, for more on all this, I'm joined by our guests from Belmont, California, Dave Carhart, Vice President at Lattice, a people management software company that helps employees identify, track, and manage their own career paths. In San Juan, Puerto Rico, Shannon Liss Reardon, a labor law attorney at the firm Lichten and Liss Reardon, PC. And in Tokyo, Casey Wall, CEO and co-founder of Attuned.ai, a recruiting platform that uses artificial intelligence to understand what motivates employees. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks for joining us today on Inside Story. Shannon, let me start with you. We know that the pandemic has transformed the workplace for many. We know that there are millions of workers out there um, who have achieved more flexibility by being able to work remotely from home. But I want to ask you about those workers who aren't able to work from home. I'm talking about gig workers. I'm talking about essential workers. How has all this impacted them? Well, yes, the, the pandemic has really exacerbated a divide um, between the haves and the have-nots, you might say. Um, there are a lot of people who have gained flexibility from being able to work wherever, whenever. Uh, and there are a lot of people out there who, who don't have the luxury of working from their homes. Uh, essential workers, gig workers, grocery store workers, um, hospital workers who have had to be in person, putting themselves at risk. Um, uh, so it's, just, it's been a very fraught time for, for a lot of people. Um, gig workers in particular, it's, it's interesting because there have been huge battles going on across the United States and across the world um, about gig workers having protections as employees. And the argument that's been made is, oh, well, they have all this flexibility, so how could they be employees? But we've seen workers across the world get flexibility and, and they still have basic rights as employees. So I think I think a lot of people have come to realize that contradiction and people have come to realize how important these workers have been just to, just to keep our society going. Dave, when it comes to working during a pandemic and especially working remotely, what lessons have been learned so far? 
Yeah, so I think what we've seen is that there's there's huge benefits for for companies where uh, they are able to enable remote and hybrid work. You can open up the talent pools that you have access to. You're able to provide employees with a lot more flexibility. Uh, we've also learned that there's big challenges, and uh, that can be in building community, in collaboration and communication norms, uh, and in uh, a sense of sometimes employees not being able to disconnect and have a, a balance between work and life. And so 2022 is, is when employers will really need to figure out how to make this all work in, in practice for a large portion of the workforce, particularly office-based work, uh, hybrid and virtual work isn't going away. Uh, and so uh, you need to figure out how to make all of those things work in practice to be able to get those benefits uh, while also dealing with some of the challenges that come along with it. Casey, how much has the pandemic led people around the world to rethink and reevaluate their relationship with work and more specifically with their jobs? It's certainly been the great reassessment. We've been in lockdowns, you know, for white collar workers, been at home type of thing. And now two years into it, people have really looked inside themselves, right? And their values, why am I doing the jobs here that I'm committed to beforehand as a gig worker or as with a company type of thing like that. And what we've seen in our data, so what we actually do is we measure people's intrinsic motivation at work and we can show and display that. And we've seen a huge shift in actually what measures people across the world. So the values that are driving people and why they're choosing their jobs, why they're choosing those companies have shifted. Uh, and it's been different because there, there's kind of individual perspectives of this. It's like a finger pen with intrinsic motivations. But we've been seeing across like surprising need for more rationality, more logical explanations from their employers, from uh, a kind of a reason for making the policies that they're doing from, from this side as well. So I think we're still starting to see the first parts of the fallout and people making different choices that align more with their values towards work from now. Shannon, you spoke before about the pandemic creating this growing divide between different types of workers. And we also know that workers' rights advocates around the world have been demanding better pay and better working conditions, especially during the pandemic for laborers. I, I want to ask you specifically about a case uh, in the U.S. Amazon reached a settlement with the National Labor Relations Board in six cases, and that's going to help pave the way for workers to unionize going forward. So I want to ask you, are we going to see more cases like this going forward, and are we going to see more workers get a seat at the table? Well, that, that's one possible silver lining we have here is that workers have found themselves in great demand uh, and they've had a greater ability to, to leverage that need for their services uh, more than we have seen in a long time. And so you're seeing workers in all types of industries demand better working conditions, demand better pay. Uh, and at the same time, uh, because of our new administration here in the United States, there is a greater focus now on workers' rights. So this is converging together. Um, we have a National Labor Relations Board who is becoming more aggressive about ensuring that workers have the ability to come together and demand better working conditions. And, and that plus the economic conditions now in which employers really need employees um, is, is creating for a lot of workers much better pay and opportunities for making demands on their workplaces and, and making them fit better with their needs and their lives. Dave, this remote work experiment that so many of us around the world have been a part of since the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, even, even on this program, we have some of the journalists we work with that are working from home. How much has it actually transformed the workplace? I, I think a huge amount. Oh, we recently did a, a survey of more than 700 HR professionals, and uh, roughly 60% of them said that in 2022, they would be in their organizations having some type of hybrid work, and a, in general, a significantly larger amount than they had pre-COVID. Uh, that affects everything from how you keep different teams aligned with each other, uh, to how you, you communicate, to uh, how you uh, 
uh, you know, information travels through an organization and, and how you work together. Uh, so it's it's having really profound impacts. And I don't think that we'll get it all right uh, as, as we go into it. And, uh, you know, setting policy is a first step, but it's going to take a number of years of experimentation to really figure this out. It's something that we've certainly seen internally at, at Lattice as, as we've moved into a hybrid workplace that uh, it really takes um, it really takes work to figure out how to make this work in practice. We've had decades of figuring out how to make a purely office-based environment work, and it, it's going to take time to figure out how to make that work in a hybrid work, work environment. Casey, you talked before about this idea of a great reassessment taking place, and there's been a lot of reporting on what's been dubbed the great resignation, uh, people frustrated, with their jobs, uh, especially during the pandemic, uh, and and really just moving on to other things, quitting their jobs. I want to ask you: Are there really that many workers that are quitting their jobs, um, or is it just that there are more people who actually want to quit now? And and is this all pandemic linked? Certainly, I don't think it's pandemic linked. I mean, the pandemic gave us in some ways, an opportunity to reassess the way we're spending a huge amount of our non-family, non-private lives where we go out in the workforce, right? If you're at home, you're at home, you don't have changing environment type of thing like that. And a lot of what Dave was kind of mentioning, some of the cracks, like companies are still adjusting with how to work with remote work and hybrid work. And the cracks that those companies had are becoming more apparent. So, you know, if you were working with a manager that your value system didn't align with, that you didn't feel psychologically safe in to raise your opinion type of thing like that, you didn't feel connected to your team before, those are only exacerbated. So I think what we're seeing is people getting, having time to understand without being able to go out to all the entertainment, all the different things that usually take up our energy. Um, and they've been able to reflect. And it's this reflection where people are starting to understand more about themselves, what really makes them happy and what they need out of work and starting to make choices. So I think this is gonna to continue to play out for years. And the companies that can be more agile and meet the needs of each individual, not just on scope, but each individual, we'll be able to retain people more and keep them more engaged and be more agile to, to kind of meet the futures. But the organizations that don't are really gonna struggle. Shannon, I know you touched on this a bit in your, in your answer a few minutes ago, but, but I'm curious to get your point of view also on this great resignation. I mean, if this does, as Casey said, continue to play out you know, for the next several years, um, is this gonna be something that really ends up having the power to bring about change? Yes, I mean, we're seeing so many changes happening and we're only just starting to get a glimpse of, of what this really means for our future. A, a related point that I do want to note is that a lot of the people out there who are resigning are people who have responsibilities for, for caregiving, for children, for elder relatives, and those responsibilities more often fall on women than on men. So a lot of the people you're seeing leaving the workforce now, it's not all by choice. Sure, there are a lot of people who are reevaluating what they want in life, what they want out of their work lives, and they are taking their time to choose different options. And there are a lot of people who don't really have a lot of choices. And you're seeing women leaving the workforce in much greater numbers than men, and that you've seen for a long time. So another issue that we're going to need to be facing as a society in the coming years is what to do about this gender divide that has been created. Um, and a lot of the women who are leaving the workforce are going to fall behind in their careers. And what are we going to do to, to try to set, set us back on track? Women have made so many advances in the workplace over the past decades. Um, and, and, and this could be a significant setback for, for women in the workplace. Shannon, if I could just follow up with you, I mean, what, from your perspective, can be done to actually rectify this? Well, I mean, there's, there is a lot of work that employers need to do, like the other panelists just mentioned, that employers are going to need to meet employees where they need to be. Um, sure, it's one thing to be flexible to let people work wherever they want, but what are you going to do about workers who aren't going to be able to um, are not going to be able to carry on with their full-time schedules or need to balance different workplace needs? And is that going to set them back in pay and promotions? 
So I just, I think a lot of sensitivity to those needs by employers, um, realizing that in the long run, it's in their interest to keep their best workers and their best talents. And if their workplace gets skewed away from many of the women who have been keeping companies and, and firms afloat and, and doing so well over the years, they're, they're gonna really need to pay attention to these issues. In addition to pay equity issues, which have been on the table for a long time, um, this is just making the need for paid family leave to be even more stark, um, as well as even greater recognition for the needs of, of working parents and particularly working women. Dave, I saw you nodding along to quite a bit of what Shannon was saying there. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think that uh, first, hybrid work and flexibility on virtual and remote options is certainly one of the things that organizations can do uh, that opens up the, uh, the ability to recruit and to bring in as broad and diverse as possible a, a group of employees. And we know that that's one of the things that helps make organizations and, and cultures more successful is that diversity. And I think to Shanna's point around uh, pay and benefits, uh, the coming year and all of these uh, different challenges that, that we're seeing, the tight labor markets, the move to hybrid work, um, all of the additional uh, employee uh, uh, power and leverage that is happening right now is really going to create a shift in compensation and, and benefits. And so I think organizations need to be looking at that right now. How do you both benchmark and set pay in a fair and equitable way. And also, how do you take a look at the benefits that you have? And whether that's including paid family leave, which many organizations still don't have, uh, or also looking at, at other benefits, time off, sabbaticals. We just introduced a, a new sabbatical policy here within Lattice, as well as additional uh, six additional company holidays, precisely because in a hybrid world, we're finding such a challenge with employees disconnecting and being able to take time off. Uh, all of that employers will need to reassess in the coming year. Casey, um, when it comes to the psychological aspect of all this and the psychological impact of what the pandemic has done when it comes to the traditional workspace, you know, there is an argument that's been made by some out there that says that office spaces, when it comes to certain types of jobs, aren't actually needed anymore. What do you say to that? It's needed for some people, for sure. I think office spaces are important for certain things. And it's almost kind of like we need as an employer myself and running a company myself and also working with our customers, they're thinking about it as how can we make this kind of a, a different place? It's not home, it's not the office as we know it, but it's somewhere with a different function that we're going to. It's where we bring people together. Those teams that got siloed, you know, during the pandemic and they don't have that crosstalk as more so they can sit next to each other, you know, speak to somebody they don't usually speak to, get that empathy, understand their customer, understand the product a little bit better. So it's facilitating these different types of interactions and bringing people together. Is it once a month? Is it every three months or every six months? Each organization needs to figure that out. But I think the purpose where, you know, it's not everybody has their desk and their stack of papers type of thing, and this is here it is, needs to shift, and especially for kind of office workers on, on that side of it. But on the psychological aspect, not everybody needs it. There's, and what we see, there's about 10% that absolutely need it and they want to go to work. And we see another 10% that don't want it. And this is across the range of data that, that we have. Casey, let me also follow up with you on another point. Uh, I, when, it, when we're talking about the psychological impact again about all of this, I mean, what does it do to workers uh, when, they get used to working from home, and then they're told they need to come back to the office, uh, perhaps for some type of hybrid work or maybe full time. And then there's another variant of the uh, of the coronavirus, and then they need to go back home again. I mean, what kind of an impact does that have? It's rough. I think in general, most people do not like change and do not embrace it. So, and this goes back to that need that we saw shifting across people's you know, desire and motivation for work is rationality. They want logical explanations. So, you know, if a company is going to go to hybrid work and they're going to move away from it or, or kind of shift their days, they need 
clear expressions and they need to give that opportunity for, for feedback so voices can be heard, that it's not just a decision, that they're part of the decision-making process type of thing like that. If it's lockdown or government related, well, okay, the government needs to explain kind of properly there and the organization needs to do that best that they can to kind of support that. So I think, you know, on the employer side of things, it's how clearly can you communicate and how early and how inclusive can you make those decision-making processes. Shannon, the International Labor Organization says that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated inequalities and pushed millions of people into poverty. Do you think that we're going to see more governments around the world move to expand social protections and to invest in job growth? I mean, I think it's absolutely a dire need. And I do think there is just greater recognition um, among the public about the, the needs of low-wage workers. They've been much more visible to so many people during the pandemic. While, while people have been locked in their homes, so many people relied on delivery workers to bring them groceries, to bring them meals from restaurants, um, to bring them packages with things they would have usually gone to a store and bought. Um, and I think that that visibility of this, what was a hidden workforce, I think is, is going to increase the pressure for greater protections and rights for these workers. And, and, and that combined with the, the need for workers now, um, I, I am hopeful that is going to lead to gains, significant gains for worker protections and worker rights and um, in, the com in the coming years. But it is a rough, it is a rough patch we're going through. Um, there are different ways that this pandemic is affecting different parts of the workforce right now. Um, but I think in the end, the, the needs of, for having these workers be available to do what we need to do to carry on is, is going to give them leverage to get better protections and, and better rights. So I am hopeful about that. Dave, how disruptive has this time been to modern business history? And what are some of the biggest challenges that businesses are going to be facing in 2022 from your vantage point? Yeah, so it, it's been an enormous disruption uh, to what you asked about before. The, you know, the, the waves of COVID, uh, lockdowns, then they come off, changing policies, that's been a huge disruption. And now with so many people reassessing their options, tight labor markets, uh, a lot of organizations are seeing rising attrition and challenges both retaining and, and recruiting employees. Obviously there's a lot of organizations that are also on the winning side of, of that equation. And when the uh, employees are, are, are quitting and resigning and choosing to, to go somewhere else, uh, there's, there's organizations that are providing the, the flexibility or responding to uh, some of those different motivators or, or needs that people are, are expressing. And so that's definitely shifting uh, the workplace and, and the market right now. I think looking to, to 2022, companies will need to figure out what this hybrid work means in practice about how they really not only set policy, but really enable the right communication, collaboration community in their organizations. And again, really rework their, their compensation and, and benefit strategy to respond to those changes in the market. Casey, we only have about a minute left. Let me just ask you, for those who are thinking of quitting their jobs or who have quit their jobs, how worried are they that they are going to be able to find a new job? I mean, how much is that concern playing into the decision making from what you've seen? It's massive. Changing a job is one of the most stressful and high anxiety things that people do in their life. And there's information disparity. They don't know what's out there. They can see a brand of a company, but they don't know the team. They don't know the manager. And, you know, people join companies and join visions, but they leave managers. And it's very hard to understand what am I actually getting myself into, even if they can find it there. So it's a tremendous amount of anxiety. In it. And I think what we can do as hirers is try to reduce that, create more transparency, more openness about, okay, this is actually what you're walking into and what you will receive and not just trying to fill a seat type of thing. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Dave Carhart, Shannon Lise Reardon, and Casey Wall. 
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjum, and the whole team here, bye for now.